the last night in Auschwitz, we were lying down before going in the slave labor camp. When one of twins I had met in Sekashfeira crawled over to me and told me that they had had to put their own parents into a gas chamber, that they were being experimented on, and that they knew when the experiments were over they would be gassed. And that since I was going out with a labor transport, I saw the chance of surviving. And would I promise that if I did, I would tell the story of what was happening in Auschwitz. Obviously, I promised. What I didn't realize was that it would take me 60 years before I would be able to tell the story. I spent my childhood in Bratislava and the uh, first three years of high school, I went to the German high school. At the end of the third year, my mother told me that I wouldn't continue at that school, because if I did, I would be thrown out. And when I questioned why this would happen, she says, the reason is that we are Jewish. I was very angry about this, because I didn't feel that I was any different, and I didn't think that I should be differentiated. One day when I was walking along the street and coming towards me came Gretel, who I'd shared my desk at school, and she went across the road, the other side of the road, so as not to acknowledge me. And I thought it was odd. I hadn't changed. She hadn't changed. Why were we being stigmatized? I arrived in Budapest, literally just with the clothes that I had on my back and a small basket in which I had my handbag, and that was it. I had no money, I had no possessions. I was dependent on other people. I arrived there in February 1942, and eventually was hidden by Dr. Markey in his apartment. When Dr. Markey took me in, I didn't realize that he was part of an organization which was helping Allied air crew who had been shot down over Germany to escape through Hungary and Yugoslavia and Greece. I didn't think it was something peculiar or something brave. It was just the sort of thing you did because of the situation in which you were. It uh, must have been about the end of May 1942 as I was walking out of the flat, that two Hungarian special service police turned up, um, arrested me and Dr. Marki and took us to the police station. I spent a week at the police station being interrogated. They were trying to get information that I didn't have, and they used every means at their disposal, which did include torture. I was then released on parole to stay with a distant relatives of my father in Sekashva Irvan. On the 5th of 6th of June, they rounded up 3,000 Jewish people in Sekashva Irvan, me included, and took us to the brickyard. The, the brickyard, it was a huge series of buildings with open sides. So I wandered around and I found that the Jewish patients from the hospital had also been evacuated there and that one part of the brickyards was actually an improvised hospital. I went and helped in the, the hospital area of the brickyard. Besides any brickyards, there are railway lines so that the bricks can be transported. 
and on the morning of the 6th of June, uh, wagons, cattle wagons pulled up and 3,000 people were being put into the wagons. There were about 50 or so people in each wagon. The last two wagons were for the patients and the doctors and nurses. And on the 12th of June in the morning, we started off on a journey which lasted five days and took us to Auschwitz-Birkenau. Well, in, in the wagon, there were several doctors and nurses with the patients. Mm -hmm. And I think it was about the second night on our journey when one of the doctors, was quite elderly, crawled over to me and she says, he says, will I just hold him, embrace him? Because he didn't think that he would have the chance to embrace a person ever again. When we arrived in Auschwitz, men in striped pyjamas pulled open the doors and told us to leave the old, the sick and the children behind. The men and women to, to get out of the wagon quickly, men to the right, women to the left. And there was a collective moan from the people in the wagon. But there was nothing we could do about it. Everything was happening quickly. We were being pushed to one side and we actually had no idea what was going to happen to the people we left in the wagons. For all we knew, they may have been taken to a hospital. We didn't know. It wasn't until quite some time later that we find out that any people who were left in the wagons were taken straight into the gas chambers and then cremated. The worst thing really was it was summer, it was thirst because except for that one bowl of soup in the midday you got no other food or water. So that was probably one of the worst things was the thirst that we were suffering from. And there were some people who just couldn't cope with it and just ran and threw themselves against the electrified fence and got stuck on it just like a butterfly on the specimen board. We used to sit and lean against the hut and we used to talk about food. We didn't, we decided we weren't going to talk about our family or our friends. That was far too painful and we didn't know what had happened to them. But we talked about food, but not fancy food. I can remember that I was dreaming about mashed potato. I mean, I ask you, mashed potato? <laughs> Sim it's something simple that you sometimes felt that you, you would love to have. We had heard rumours about Auschwitz, but we didn't believe it because we didn't think that a civilised nation like the Germans would do some things like that. We didn't think that uh, this was even a possibility of happening. And to find that not only was everything we were told true, but it was actually much worse that we were being dehumanised, that we were being treated not like people. We were being shaved, we were being shepherded, we were... I, I don't really know how to express it. Um, sheep are treated better than we were. And the thing was, it happened so quickly that we didn't really have a response to it because it just overwhelmed us. We were just being put through a machine. And the end result was this.
the only way we could tell the passage of time was because once a week we were being taken to be showered. Now you were marched along to the blocks where the showers were and you never knew whether you were going to be showered or gassed. It's the same block served both purposes. And after you stripped and you went in, it was only when you saw water coming down that you realised that you were being showered and that you were going to live, hopefully, another week. It was the end of July when Dr Mengele asked for volunteers to go with the labour transport and we five of us stepped forward because if you got away from Auschwitz you had a chance to survive. And next morning we started on our journey which also took about five days until we arrived in Lippstadt on the 1st of September 1944. There were 530 of us who arrived in Lipstadt, the armament factory. Um, the factory itself did, did uh, produce machine gun bullets, panzerfaust, anti-tank weapons, and various small armaments. I, because I spoke fluent German, I was told to set up a Revere camp hospital. And uh, considering that. We had very little medication between our arrival there on 1st of September 1944 and until we left about the end of March. It's quite miraculous that only, we only had eight deaths. At the end of February, they asked us to evacuate the hospitals. Wagons came along and we were told to put all the people who were ill or who were unable to walk into the wagon. And we were, at this stage, we also had to uh, egg, mm, denounce or sort of, mm, tell the Germans that they had three mothers with babies because they couldn't possibly have walked while they were nursing the babies. So we were told for the mothers and babies to go into the wagons as well. And one of the mothers put the baby by the opening of it, prob probably to find it to get fresh air. And when the Germans had marked on their list everybody who, the, who was going to go, um, he swung himself up into the wagon and accidentally or on purpose stepped on that baby, killed it outright. You can imagine the response of the mother, you can imagine all our response. But he turned to me and told me in German, Tell the woman I probably saved her life because if she, with the baby, arrived in Bergen-Belsen, they would both go in the gas chamber. And as it is, now that her baby is dead, she has a chance of survival. to say that I probably saved your life because I killed your child. It, it's just weird. Who would say that I killed your child so that you may live? It's the, the whole mindset of people I found, of the Germans, not all Germans, but many of the German soldiers, I found very twisted. The train went off for Bergen-Belsen and we started a few days later our march and we marched in the night time and were hidden barns in the day in, during the day. Probably so that the German population should know what was going on. After about five nights um, walking, we came to a place where there were no barns, a place like Kau called Kaunitz. And there was a freshly ploughed field there, and they told us to lie down in the field, and the soldiers themselves lay down in the ditches. 
And there were aeroplanes overhead, and uh, the church bells were ringing, and there were white sheets hanging from the windows in the distance in the little village. And then we saw on the main road American tanks coming along, and they stopped in the square in front of the field. Hundreds of women jumped out of the field and surrounded the tanks. And what the Americans must have thought, I just can't imagine. I was still lying in the field because I couldn't move, so my friends picked me up and took me to a farmhouse nearby, put me on a wooden settle. And at the table, at breakfast, was an elderly man, a woman, and a little girl. And the little girl whispered something to her mother, and her mother nodded her head. And she got off the chair and came towards me with her hands like this. And in her hand was an egg. And she says, it's Easter Sunday. Now, can you think of a better day to be liberated on than Easter Sunday? I made the promise to the twin, but first of all, I didn't realize that it would take me six years before I would be able to fulfill the promise, and promises are made to be kept. You don't make promises otherwise. Um, and I think what I'm doing at present is keeping that promise, is to teach young people, to tell young people, and not only young people, but people generally, anybody who will listen, that there shouldn't be a situation of us and them, that we should realize that differences in religion, ethnicity, color, gender, don't really make a difference because under the skin we are all the same. I shall continue to talk to people who are willing to listen as long as I'm able to do so. And all I'm hoping is that they will learn from it, that under the skin we are all the same. Mm -hmm.